Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody, and uh, once again, we're going to pick right up where we left off. We'll be in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll be starting in verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, we've got it on the board. Now again, I guess I could remind our listening audience, if you want to order any of these particular four programs, it will be in book 47. We are in the first two hours, and we are now in the fourth program. So if you uh, want to order before you actually get one of our catalogs, why just tell one of the girls that little bit of information. Again, we always like to thank our listening audience for your response, for your prayers, for everything. My Irish and I, one old gentleman called from Colorado Springs a while back and he said, Les, do you know that you're blessed? <laughs> well, that's obvious. That's obvious. And uh, so, yes, we know that we're blessed. The Lord has been so good and uh, we just give him all the praise and all the glory. All right, I think uh, we're ready to go right on into our fourth program then in Hebrews chapter 2. And now we'll go on into verse 9. We've established that he is the one who will be the King of kings and Lord of lords of the world to come. That is, this inhabited earth that will be made like the Garden of Eden. And uh, he will be higher than the angels, even though for the work of the cross he became lower than the angels. But uh, now then, as the one who will be the ruler and the king of this coming kingdom, we find that the last part of verse 8 gives us a clue now that even though all these things are being made ready, we know it's coming. It hasn't happened yet. And so that's what it says. But now we see not yet all things put under him. It's still in a future time. Verse 9, but this much we know, even though the kingdom hasn't come in yet, it's going to, but we do see Jesus, who was made again, this same, this same line of thought, who was made a little lower than the angels, or made lower than the angels for just a little while, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for how many? For everyone. Not just for those who will be saved and go to glory, but he tastes the death for the billions that are going to go to their doom. And of course that's what's going to make it so awful. I think the worst part of the lake of fire will be that people will realize they did not have to be there. They're there because they chose to be, and it's going to be a horrible time of regret. Why didn't I take what was offered? But it's going to be too late. But the thing that we always like to emphasize is that when Christ finished the work of the cross, he opened salvation to every last human being. Everyone. In fact, I guess this is as good a time as any. Let's go back again. John's Gospel, honey. I wasn't going to do that, but uh, the thought comes to mind. We better use it. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 9. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 9. And when I taught it before, I'll say it again. As I've said before, I can't explain this. But I, the Word of God says it, and I believe it. But I can't explain it. I don't know how this can possibly be. It's John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 9. An awesome verse. That, speaking of Jesus the Christ, the light of the world, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's what it says. I can't argue with that. Now, I know it's hard for us to comprehend. 
how can an aborigine out there in the outback of Australia who has probably, we think, never heard the gospel, yet the scripture says he has received enough light that he could escape condemnation. And I don't know how it is. And again, along with that, I always have to use Romans chapter 1, verse 20, which before I saw John chapter 1, verse 9 several years ago, I wondered how Paul could write, even by inspiration. How could he write something like this? When we think that there are millions who have never heard. And if they've never heard, how can they be responsible? Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's what humans think. That's what even a lot of us are prone to think. If they've never heard, how can they be responsible? All right, Romans chapter 1, dropping down to verse 20. Romans 1, verse 20. And that's the sort of the clue. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. In other words, before Adam was even created. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, the stars and the sun and the moon. <clears throat> Even his eternal power and his Godhead, so that they, the multitudes of the human race that we think have never heard, so that they are without excuse. Awesome words, isn't it? And they're going to come before the great white throne without a word of argument. And they are suddenly going to know that they deserve the doom that is coming because they rejected the light that was given. All right, so now then, we're going to look at this whole idea of death. I alluded to it in the last program that we'd be looking at, how that Christ not only will become king of kings, and he's going to put everything of the secular world under his feet, but he's also going to defeat our arch enemy, death. And the only way you can defeat death is with death. The only way you can defeat death is with death. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Chapter 2, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. All right, let's read it. The Lord is talking to Adam, and he says, verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely, what? Die. Die. Death. Now then, the moment that Adam ate, what, what entered? Death. Death became part and parcel of the human experience as well as all of nature. Everything is facing death. All right, let's look at the next one in the, still in the Old Testament in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18. <clears throat> Ezekiel 18. We're just going to see from Scripture that this is not just a one-time statement. It's one of the very fundamental truths that we have to face. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. And it's a verse, I guess, that throws a curve at a lot of people because of the very first statement. Well, of of course every soul that's ever lived is God's because they came from God. They are God's. But it's going to be up to His sovereignty to determine whether they spend eternity with Him or separated from Him. But that doesn't take away the fact of the first part of this verse. Verse 4, Ezekiel 18, Behold, all souls are mine. 
as the soul of the Father, so also the Son, the soul of the Son is mine. But now here comes that crowning statement. The soul that sinneth shall what? Die. There's no escaping. The whole human race is headed for death. Now, first and foremost, we look at physical death. We're all, unless the Lord comes, going to die physically. But there's two areas of life and death that we have to deal with, and that is the spiritual. And so we also have to look then that there is coming a spiritual death as well as the physical. Now, we saw in John 5, last program, how that Jesus spoke of a resurrection of those who were spiritually alive by virtue of their faith, and on the other hand, those who would be uh, physically dead, and uh, the two, of course, we have to always keep separate. All right, now I'm going to bring you all the way up to John's Gospel, chapter 12, because this is one of the fundamental truths of Scripture that the only way you can overcome death is with death. And this is why Christ had to die. In fact, I had a thought come up last night as I was mulling all this, and I was just sharing it with a couple of the guys at break time. Now I'm going to be very careful how I say this. I don't want somebody writing me a real strong, nasty letter and said, less you said. But I am going to throw something out just to provoke your thinking. And if I happen to have a physiologist out there in my audience or an embryologist, uh, I'd like to hear from them. And this thought crossed my mind. Since everything in Scripture speaks of death, being overcome with death, or you cannot have life until there is death. And I always use the plant kingdom for an example, because you're all acquainted with gardening and what have you, or agriculture of some sort. And that is that if you plant a seed in the moist, warm soil, what happens to that original seed? It dies. Anybody that's ever been in biology knows that. That seed dies. Now, out of that death process, what happens next? New life and reproduction. All right, now the thought crossed my mind, and I'm going to be very careful. I'm not saying this is what happens. I'm asking if it may. And that is that when the sperm invades the female ovum at conception, does that ovum die at least temporarily. I kind of think so. Now don't go out and quote me and don't say, well, Les says that the ovum dies when the sperm invades it. But it would almost fit with all of nature that before something can have new life, something has to die. And so think about it. Like I said, if I've got a professional out there, let me know because I think there's probably more to that than meets the eye. Now, here is the way the Lord Jesus himself put it. John's Gospel, chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 23. <clears throat> and, of course, this is the time when <clears throat> three Gentile, I shouldn't say three, it just says certain, however many there were. I don't know where I got the number three, but I suppose uh, whatever. But there were certain Greeks, Gentiles who had no doubt heard all about Jesus' earthly ministry and all the miracles and signs and wonders that he had performed, and uh, their curiosity was, was uh, exercised. And so they come and approach Andrew and uh, Philip, and then they go in and tell Jesus that there are Greeks that want to see him. All right, now verse 23. <clears throat> and Jesus answered them and said, The hour is come. Now remember, this is the great feast of Passover that the people are already gathering around the temple area. <clears throat> so his crucifixion is a matter of hours. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. <clears throat> verily, verily, I say unto you, except or unless 
a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and die, it, the kernel, abideth alone. But if it die, then what? It bringeth forth much fruit. Now the whole concept of nature <clears throat> is based on that very concept. Now spiritually, let's look at it from Paul's point of view. And let's go to Romans a minute. Romans, let's just look at chapter 3. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. where you'll find that <clears throat> as a result of the spiritual death of man brought about by Adam, <clears throat> this is the result. This is the result of the spiritual death that came in by Adam's fall. <clears throat> Romans 3, verse 9. Romans 3, verse 9. All got it? What then, Paul asks, are we, speaking of himself as a Jew, are we Jews better than they, those Gentiles? <clears throat> no, in no wise. <clears throat> Excuse me. For we have before proved, both Jew and Gentile, that they are all under what? Sin. And what's synonymous with sin? Death. Everybody, Jew and Gentile, are under the curse of sin and death. Consequently then, verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. You know, I was looking at some of our old programs while we were dubbing them, I guess, and uh, I suppose some of these statements shock people. And in one of my programs, I made the statement that man never goes looking after God. God always seeks the sinner. And I went back to Adam and Eve in the garden. After they had sinned and they sowed their fig leaves and they knew God was coming down the path, did they run to meet him? No. What'd they do? They hid. They hid. Well, what did God do? He went looking for them. Not that he didn't know where they were, but the whole idea was to show us that God seeks the sinner. Well, now, when you get to John's Gospel, that's exactly what it says. In fact, I guess the best way to do it, honey, we've got to let them see it with their own eyes. Come back to John's Gospel, chapter 3. John's Gospel, chapter 3. Because, see, this is the mental makeup of sinful men and women and boys and girls. We're all alike. And this is the true picture. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 19. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 19. I hope you still got your hand in Romans, because we're going to go right back there. <coughs> All got it? Romans 3, verse 19. I mean, John 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation. This is mankind's problem that light is come into the world. See how that fit with what we read a moment ago? Light has come into the world, but what's the problem? Men loved darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil, in other words, anything contrary to the will of God, Everyone that doeth evil hates the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Now, in your mind eye, can you picture Adam and Eve? This is the perfect picture. They had sin. They sowed fig leaves. But were they ready to meet their righteous Lord? No. So instead of running to meet him and get right with him, What'd they do? They ran and hid because their deeds were evil. They had been disobedient. And this is the perfect picture of it. And so, since they had now done evil, they hated the light, they didn't want to come to the light, and so they ran and hid. 
All right, now then come back to Romans, and this is just an extension of all this. Evil men are what they are because they've rejected the light. All right, reading on in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Verse 11. There is none that understandeth. Why? Because we're a fallen race. We are bent to sin because of Adam. You remember, I've put it on the board over and over over the years. We're not sinners because we have sinned. We sin because we're sinners. Well, that's what these verses are telling us. That the human race is just bent to sin. Verse 12, they are all the human race, not just Jew, not just Gentile. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then he goes on to describe the human nature. And the culmination of it is verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now that seems like a harsh statement, but it's true. They really don't fear Him. And even if they do want to recognize that there is an eternity out there, you know what they rationalize? Well, I don't think I've been that bad. I think God will be good to me. I think He'll let me in. And they cannot comprehend that God cannot tolerate their sin when He has done everything that He has done to bring about their salvation. All right, now then, I think I can come all the way down to verse 23, still in Romans 3, still in Romans chapter 3, and here is the Apostle Paul's, by inspiration of the Spirit's, conclusion. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody in their human element can hit the mark. It's impossible. We're sons of Adam. All right, but then verse 24 is the great promise. Yes, we're under the condemnation. We are a fallen race. But we are being justified freely, not because of our works, not because of what we can do, but by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Well, that's enough for that portion. Let's look on to another one. Turn the page to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Starting at verse 1. Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Therefore, because of what we've just been reading in chapter 3, that we're a fallen race, we are in total depravity. But therefore, being justified by faith, not by works, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now stop and think a minute. You know we're surrounded by people that are just bound by a works religion. We were just talking about it back there at break time over a cup of coffee. The bondage that so many people are in with a works-oriented religion, whatever it is. And they are just in constant fear. I mean, I talk to them constantly. They are in constant fear that maybe they aren't going to be able to work enough to make it. And there's never any joy. There's never any peace with God because it's depending on their works. And that's an awful place to be. Horrible. When the Bible makes it so plain that when we come in not resting on our works, but we're resting on what Christ has tasted for every man, death, that we can have peace with God. And then there's no more, oh, I wonder if I can make it. I wonder if I'm going to get to heaven. We know because we have. All right, back to the text. Romans 5, 1. 
therefore being justified by faith, not works, we have peace with God. You know, I've given the example on the program of people who have come in to our home and, and here in taping and in some of our classes, and they've come out of some of these works religions. And I guess the, the clearest one that a gentleman made, more, and we've heard it from others, is just like somebody knocked the shackles off my wrists. Well, that's the freedom that we have when we enter in by faith rather than trying to determine our works. All right, now I still want to stay with this whole concept that Christ died for us. A little further down in Romans chapter 5. Just write same chapter, Romans chapter 5, and come on down to verse 6. And remember, this is all going back to that verse in Hebrews whereby Christ tasted death for everyone. No one can ever say, well, he didn't do enough for me. Oh, yes, he did. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, we were hopeless. In due time, Christ died for what kind of people? The ungodly. Not for good people. He died for the ungodly. Now here comes verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would dare to die. In other words, yeah, that could be possible. Here is a fellow that is so admirable and he is so looked up to and he suddenly gets framed or whatever and we could say, well, someone would probably come along and offer to take his punishment. That's a possibility. But for a no good, a reprobate, an off-scouring of society, who would ever offer to die for that kind of a person? Well, we'd probably say, well, nobody would. It's almost good riddance. But listen, that's what we were. That's what I was. And Christ, the righteous creator God, died for us. Verse 8, and well, this I guess we'll have to close. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet, what? Sinners. Christ died for us. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.